One of the most dreaded things about traveling is definitely being stuck on an airplane in economy for a really long flight. And so in this video, I'm going to give you 44 of my tips for surviving a long flight in economy. And Chris, what do you know about this? Uh, well, we live in Los Angeles area and we like to travel to Asia and most of the flights are long in that case. You know, we're on the regular taking 10, 12, 15 hour flights if we're headed to Singapore. And so we know a thing or two about surviving those and coming out the other side, not wasted and exhausted, but at least as refreshed as you can be. And so as we go through this, we're going to start with number one. My tip number one for you is that not all seats in economy are created the same. Uh, the things that you want to look for when you're looking for a seat and in fact an airline and in fact an airplane to sit on is the width of the seat. That's how wide you get. You want to look at the pitch, which is the distance from your seat back to the seat back in front of you, which roughly equates to leg room. And then you want to look at how far back do the seats recline. This is all information that's available online. And so if you're debating, should I fly American Airlines or should I fly Japan Airlines or should I fly Southwest Airlines in the economy seats, taking a look at how big those seats are can make a big difference for your flight. Now, you definitely want to consider, do you want the aisle seat? Do you want the window seat? Because the middle seat is definitely going to be the worst seat in your long flight in economy. Um, but a couple of like pro tips I have for you, if you're with a couple, like you're with another person, you know, you could certainly book an aisle and a middle or a middle and a window. You could also book across the aisle from each other. If you both like aisles, there's no reason that one of you has to be in an aisle and the other of you has to be in the middle seat. One of you can book on this side of the aisle and the other one can book on the other side of the aisle. Or you could consider skipping the middle seat entirely. If you're in a three, three configuration with one aisle in the middle, well, one of you could book seat A by the window. The other one could book seat C by the aisle, leaving B empty. And then the likelihood that somebody else, if the flight's not too busy, is going to book that middle seat is pretty low. Uh, now, if the flight's full, you'll get somebody in that middle seat. But chances are then if you want to sit next to your traveling partner, I'm sure that person in the middle seat will be happy to switch with either of you from an aisle to a window because either of those is better than the middle seat. And one of the seats that I think is super best when you're looking at seat maps is if there's ever a seat in economy without one in front of it. I'm going to show you a picture of those later. But uh, I also really recommend this website called SeatGuru.com, Guru, G-U-R-U, where they've got maps of all the different airlines and all the different planes and all the different configurations. And you can see in green the ones that are better than the ones in red, and they'll even tell you why. So I always use that when I'm looking to book my seats. Uh, all right. So now the second tip that I have for you to survive a long flight in economy, and by the way, these are all things right now about things to do before your flight that you can prepare to make it better. Then we'll talk about things uh, you want to do in the airport to set yourself up for the flight. And then we're going to talk about things to actually do on your flight once you're there to make that experience as good as possible. But a lot of surviving a long flight has to do with your preparation just like camping, you know, how do you have a good camping experience by preparing well for it? And so uh, my second tip is to look for the best section on the plane. And if you like something quiet, then the front of the plane, the front of the plane is going to be the most quiet. If you like something that is the least turbulent, then you're going to want to pick some seats that are right over the wings. The more in the middle of the plane you are, the less bumpy it's going to be if you have some extreme turbulence. Um, you know, another benefit though of the front is that if you want to eat quickly and then go to sleep, you know, being as close as you can to the front of economy means you're going to get your food sooner than everybody else. So you can get rid of your food sooner than everybody else. So you've got more time to sleep without your tray there. And now if you sit further in the back, this is another pro tip. Some, sometimes the back can be really good. Why, Chris? The back is noisy. Nobody wants to sit in the back. I'd rather sit up front because people, other people, like to sit up front. When the airline fills the seats automatically, they generally start from the front. And so if you're looking for empty seats or you're hoping to have a row 
all to yourself in the event that the plane's not full, that is more likely to happen further to the back of the plane than in the front. Now, I never love like the back back row, um, but a few rows from the back, you know, uh, if you get three seats all to yourself, that's gonna be a prime sleeping bench for you later on in your flight. Now, beware of the emergency exit rows. Emergency exit rows, while they'll often show up on seat maps as having more legroom, because there's like a door there that you can go out of, if you're sitting in the window seat next to the emergency exit, it can often be really cold because they don't seal perfectly well. Uh, and so a lot of times I call the emergency exit row the cold feet seat because your feet are right next to that crack in the door where some air flows through. And so make sure you brought yourself some extra warm clothing if you're seated right next to the emergency exit. Another um, seat area you might want to consider, and it's actually where I took this picture, is the bulkhead seat. That'll be generally the front of the front of economy or maybe in the middle where they have another bulkhead. Uh, and in that case, there's typically more legroom. Great if you have kids so they can get down and run around. There's no seat in front of them to kick. However, if you're in a bulkhead seat, then there's no seat in front of you, which means you can't put your stuff under the seat in front of you. And then two, because people like us with kids often like to book the bulkhead seats, then you might be with other people with kids or even babies because that's where they typically put the bassinets for babies to be on mid-flight. So you might have the crying baby next to you. That's the roll the dice that you roll if you bulk the bulkhead seat. Now, uh, Points Traveler also points out emergency exit row seats do not recline, kind of. Um, so like, on United, like 757s, the um, last emergency exit row does recline. Like if there's two emergency exit doors, the first row won't because there's an emergency exit behind it. So those seats don't recline into that. But then the last emergency exit row reclines because there's no seats behind it. So you actually um, can look and see, hey, do my emergency exit seats recline? Because I'm always the one picking like, okay, I want the ones that actually do recline. Because on a long flight, having one that reclines, big difference than a seat that's stuck uh, right up front. All right, and uh, Ill Ford takes us to number three, which is to avoid rows near the bathroom areas. Yeah, um, there are sort of two, which I would say to avoid, and that's seats near the bathrooms, and seats near the kitchen or the galley. Why? Well, if you're near the bathroom, boy, there's gonna be a lot of noise from the door opening and closing. There's gonna be light coming in your eyes from the door opening and closing. And if you're in like a front seat like this that's near a restroom, people are gonna to tend to congregate in front of you. And if you don't have a seat in front of you like this plus seat, which is actually like, you can actually see the picture back here in blue. I'll make this big so you can see this. Uh, you can see the blue seat right there. That's the typical economy seat. This is when I flew San Francisco to Singapore. I did upgrade to the premium plus seats, which are like the equivalent of a domestic first class seat. They're a bigger seat instead of three across, they're two across, um, so they're wider. They've got more space like this, but there are a lot of airlines that charge you for better economy seats that it turns out they don't have any more leg room. They're just as wide as the other ones. All they are are in a more desirable location than others. Now, sometimes if you're on United, they do have a, a certain type of their economy seats that have extra leg room and American Airlines has the same thing. And so if you are hoping to buy up to better seats, make sure you actually get better seats. Um, and uh, so the other uh, thing you should think about when you're looking for seats is if you're flying Southwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines, there's no seat. There's no assigned seating at all. Uh, assigned seating for Southwest, well, it's actually just everybody boards and you get a, a boarding letter and number, which gives you earlier boarding. And so if you want better seats on Southwest, then you want to book your seats. You want to get, you want to check in online 
way before everybody else, which means 24 hours, exactly 24 hours before, which means you'll be able to get on before everybody else, which means you have your choice of seats. Southwest Airlines also has like a priority boarding, a priority check-in that you can buy called early bird check-in. And in that case, you're like guaranteed one of the earlier numbers. Really good if you want one of the choice or better seats on Southwest. Now my fifth tip is that you should make sure you're booking the better seats on better planes. Not all planes across a similar airline have similar seats. Some can be more comfortable than others. And it's actually more than just the seats too. I really like to fly on the um, Boeing 787s, which is known as the Dreamliner, because the actual pressurization in the cabin makes you feel like you're flying at a lower altitude than on most other aircraft, and I can sleep much better on a Boeing Dreamliner than I can on most other planes. And so, generally, the newer the plane, the better and the more comfortable. And so, as you're taking a look at different flights and different flight options, even on different times on the same airline, you know, take a look at the ones that have um, more comfortable seats. Uh, Kel L says, very narrow seats on Southwest. Yeah, and again, it de also depends on the plane too. Southwest generally has a larger pitch, meaning seat back to seat back than say domestic American Airlines in regular economy. Um, what you do have to be aware of related to narrow seats too, when I mentioned the emergency exit seats or the bulkhead seats, any seats that have the tray table in the armrest instead of in front of you, then the seats become narrower because now they've put the tray table in the armrest, which means there's less space for you because they've stuck a tray table there. If you're sort of a big and wide guy like me, um, that can actually be a big deal that inch or two. And then, you know, on some of these airlines uh, where it may be you know, nine seats across an economy, well, then you've got American Airlines coming in saying, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna put 10 seats across an economy. And boy, that, that is a tight fit, let me tell you. All right, I'm thirsty. What's Chris drinking today? Chris is drinking this Nachan Apple um, imported from Kobe, Japan. It is a uh, sparkling apple juice with a very happy apple on it. Quite pleasant. Mm. All right. Tip number six is if you didn't get that seat that you wanted during booking time, keep checking. People move. People cancel their flights. People change to other flights. And so chances are you can get a better seat. Uh, by the way, this picture right here, this is the uh, no seat in front of you seat that I talked about. This is in fact on Southwest Airlines. Uh, and you can also see it's an emergency exit seat. So there's an emergency exit right over there, meaning that's the cold feet seat. But that is my favorite seat on Southwest Airlines window seat. And it's got basically unlimited leg room and still a seat pocket up there to put your stuff in, although it's a little bit far away. Now, if you are still trying to like desperately get a seat that's better, an aisle seat or a window seat, and you're stuck in a middle seat, uh, 24 hours before the flight, once people start to check in, that's when there's like a lot of movement because now a lot of people are going online, selecting other seats, moving around. And so, you know, if it's me and I've got like the web, the airline has an app, I'll be on that app every 15 minutes, you know, compulsively being like, can I get out of my middle seat? Can I get an aisle seat? Can I get an aisle seat? Can I get an aisle seat? Because if I'm going to be in there for 15 hours, boy, an aisle between the middle is a big deal. Um, now, uh, tip number seven is uh, in-flight entertainment. In-flight entertainment can be a big deal. And so if you want to be entertained, look for a flight that has in-flight entertainment. You know, you might have flown one or two flights and always had a TV in the seat back, uh, but that doesn't mean there's always TVs in the seat backs. You know, many airlines, the discount carriers of the world have got rid of these things or never put them in, and it can be a pretty boring 15 hours if you don't have any entertainment or the entertainment's just not very good. Generally, the newer the plane, the more movies, the better the entertainment's gonna be. The older the plane, the less movies you're gonna have. Um, and, what I would also say is the older planes tend to have a box or a computer for that in-flight entertainment that's like in your leg room. And so you have reduced leg room on a lot of these long haul flights that are older planes with seat back entertainment. The newer planes, they figured out how to like 
minimize all of that and just stick it in the seat back. So that's another thing to be aware of. Tip number eight is to bring power. Uh, because not all airlines have power for every single seat. You might have shared power. You might have no power at all. And so if you're going to be, you know, on your device for a long flight playing Angry Birds or something like that really helps to have a battery backup so you can, you know, charge your phone three times from one of these like Samsung power bricks. Uh, and if you're reliant on power, there's another one where like you might have booked a certain plane that has power, but then something happens to that plane and they need to switch you to another plane. And in that case, you'll be glad that you had the battery back up. Uh, and tip number nine is to bring your own headphones. There's many people who will say like, well, Chris, they'll provide headphones for me. I can just use theirs. Theirs stink. Like airline headphones are like the worst headphones provided in the world. Some airlines even charge you $3 for them. Sometimes they don't even have them at all. So bring your own pair of headphones. Make sure it has an adapter because sometimes you need to adapt that three and a half inch plug to the two prong thing. Yes, there's still airplanes that have that two prong plug. Uh, but the headphones you should really get if you're an avid traveler, you're traveling a lot, this tip number nine is to bring and buy a pair of noise canceling headphones. These are the ones that I like. I have had lots of different noise canceling headphones over my traveling career and the Sony WH-1000XM4s are my favorite noise canceling headphones currently. They're really comfortable, they fold up, they have a USB-C connector and you can get them in a few different colors. I take these if I'm going on a long flight. If I'm going on a shorter flight and size is more important to me, then I will carry a pair of AirPods Pros. Those are the small AirPods that come in a small case. The Pros are the ones that are noise canceling. And while those are good, they don't get as loud as these do. And so if I, by loud, like my movies aren't as loud. And two, they don't cancel out as much noise. And so if I'm really trying to sleep, I find these really help me drown out the plane sounds and the people sounds and all that stuff and just make it a quiet zen place. I can either enjoy my movie in peace or enjoy my sleep in peace. The Pokemon dentist says, bows are the best, just saying. I have a ton of Bose headphones uh, and I like the Sony's better. I know it's all a case of personal preference. I used to be an avid Bose fan, but I just switched to these Sony's about four months ago. And yes, I like them better. Uh, and uh, Genified says airline headphones are not that great, but I always hold on to them in case I need them later. Yeah, if you get like the little earbuds for $3 or even free, you know, it doesn't hurt to just toss those in your backpack. They're pretty small and then you might have them later. Uh, and uh, Pokemon Dentist says you need the wired ones or wired option. Yeah, so definitely if you're getting headphones and you wanna connect to the in-flight entertainment, you do need something with a cable. For me, when I'm using my AirPods Pros, my wireless ones, then I'm typically doing that with my tip number 11, which is to bring an iPad mini as a great entertainment player. Uh, because sometimes the in-flight entertainment breaks. On my flight last week, uh, coming back from Boston to LAX on JetBlue, I had the dreaded white screen of death on my DirecTV monitor. It didn't work at all for the six hour flight. <laughs> really boring. But the good news is I had my iPad mini with me uh, and I downloaded movies. I always have a bunch of movies downloaded to my iPad mini. I've got Disney Plus, Netflix, and Amazon Prime all on there, all with a bunch of stuff downloaded. And if you do download stuff, um, be aware that often on these apps, you have to like refresh them or reconnect every 30 days. Otherwise it like, won't let you play it. And there's nothing that's more of a drag than downloading a bunch of movies to your tablet and then getting on the plane and finding out you can't play them because you haven't like connected to the internet recently so it doesn't think you're authorized to do them. Uh, Grant says, I took your iPad mini suggestion for my trip to Denmark. It was great. That's awesome to hear, Grant. Um, and I think the iPad mini, this is a picture of it. I took this picture on purpose to show you how 
You can still have the iPad mini on your tray table, plus have some food, plus have some drinks, and if you have almost anything bigger, then your food and your drinks and stuff aren't gonna fit on the tray table. And the iPad mini battery will last for like eight hours of movie playing. It lasts a really long time. What is really cool, if you have an iPad mini, and you also have the AirPods Pros, is they are uh, spatial Bluetooth, and so when you turn your head around, the sound will actually sound like it's coming from wherever your iPad is. I just I just think that's super neat. Uh, Daniel says Android is better. You know what, I've got, um, I'm an Android phone kind of guy. I definitely love my Android phones, but I think the iPad mini is the best tablet um, to watch movies on airplanes. Uh, Kathy says, maybe I better buy one. Um, yeah, I think they're, I think it's a good movie playing device. Okay, tip number 12. This one sounds like a no-brainer, but sometimes it bites me, um, which is to ensure your devices are all fully charged before you go. Uh, nothing's worse than you to open your iPad and find out it has no battery. This is gonna be really boring. Ah, uh, turn on your headphones. Oh, there's no, there's no battery on those headphones either. And so I make it a ritual the night before I go on any trip to like take out all my devices and plug them all into charge. And in my case at home, I've got like six different USB cables so that I can charge everything all at the same time so that I'm not having to share between them. Charge my laptop, charge my phone, charge my headphones, charge my iPad mini and I can see them all and I can see them all charging and then once they're all done I can take them all out and put them in my backpack. Tip number 13 is to, as you're packing, to prepare all the stuff in one bag that you want in your seat. Uh, if you're just carrying stuff on a plane, generally you get to carry on one big item that goes in the overhead and one small item that goes under your seat. And so anything that you're gonna need while you're on the plane, put in the thing that you're gonna have under the seat so that you can get it easily and you're not having to rummage through the overhead bin up there. Uh, and so this definitely requires you to think about, okay, what is it that I'm gonna need and then putting that all in one place. Tip number 14 is to pack some snacks. Yes, they provide food on planes, but it's not always a lot of food. <laughs> and it might not always be the food at the time you want it, and it might not always be food that you like. And so pack some things that you like. If you like the all-dressed ruffles, then pack yourself the all-dressed ruffles. Um, and I always like to have some power bars and some chocolates and things like that in my backpack because flights do get delayed. You might be stuck on the runway for three hours before you take off and they're not bringing you any food and you'll be happy that you have a power bar or a bag of chips in your bag. Uh, Daniel says Dollar Tree food for snacks. That's a good tip. Uh, Nick says raid the Delta Biscoffs. Yeah, this is another good tip that like if you're in a plane and they give you some snacks and you don't eat them right away, you can totally pack them for later. Uh, Ilford really likes Snickers and Twix, and Valerian the Mac really likes pork rinds. <laughs> All right, uh, that sounds quite healthy. Um, tip number 15 is the night before to get yourself a good night's sleep. Uh, and so sometimes people think, well, the way they're gonna sleep on the plane is just not by sleeping at all the night before. A huge mistake, don't do that. Um, because you know what, even if you do fall asleep on the plane, it's not really good sleep, it's not really quality sleep. The sleep in your bed is gonna be much better sleep. And if you didn't sleep all night, you're just gonna be super exhausted, zombieing your way through the airport, zombieing your way to the plane. Now, what I would recommend if you're going to a number of different time zones as a difference, is to consider adjusting your sleep routine to prepare for jet lag a few days early. So for example, how would you do that? Well, if you usually go to bed at 10 p.m., you know, start adjusting and three days before go to bed at 9 p.m. and go to bed at 8 p.m. and go to bed at 7 p.m. and slowly adjust yourself that way. Um, but, uh, you know, if you stay awake uh, for the 24 hours before your trip, um, and you're sure it's gonna balance itself out before you arrive, <laughs> 
no chance, not gonna work. Tip 16, this is one for me and this not baby for everybody because I know that um, Claritin D isn't an over-counter drug uh, everywhere in the world, but uh, I often get a really stuffy nose on airplanes and so I typically take a decongestant before I travel, in particular Claritin D, this antihistamine. Um, beware if you're traveling with these things that they're not always legal as over-the-counter medicine, um, but if I'm traveling someplace that is legal as over-the-counter medicine, I'll take one when I go and then I'll take another pill with me for when I go back to make sure my head stays nice and clear. Tip number 17 is about clothing. Uh, and I got uh, three tips about clothing. And so my first tip about clothing is to wear bamboo clothing. Uh, bamboo clothing, really, it doesn't stink. It doesn't smell. Like, uh, I particularly like them from this brand Caraloha, although I have a number of different bamboo shirts, but this is one that I found that like, always has clothes made with bamboo and they always don't stink. They're not the cheapest things in the world, but I don't wear them all the time. I just wear my bamboo shirts when I'm traveling because they're kind of expensive. Tip number 18 is to wear a black shirt. So yes, this is a black bamboo shirt. And when you see a lot of pictures of me traveling, it's in, in the airports, it's in a black shirt. Why? Well, because if you're sitting on an airplane and you got a screen in front of you for in-flight entertainment, whether that's on the seat back or whether that's your iPad or whether that's your computer, if you have a bright shirt like this yellow shirt, it's gonna reflect off that in-flight entertainment screen and you're gonna have to really work harder with your eyes to see the screen past the reflection of your bright shirt. And so if you wear a dark colored shirt, then you don't end up with reflections on that in-flight entertainment screen. Tip 19 is to bring layers because you never know on an airplane whether it's gonna be hot, whether it's gonna be cold. And so I typically like to travel with a short sleeve shirt. You saw me just right there. And then I like to stick a light long sleeve shirt in my backpack, all wadded up. It's gonna be super wrinkled if I pull it out. But by the time I'm on an airplane and I'm cold, I don't care if my thing is all super wrinkled. I really like these um, fairly thin long sleeve shirts from Ex Officio, though you'll find tons of brands that make these sorts of things. Um, I like these because they also are bug repellent and so they work double purpose. They work in my backpack as a put them on to stay warm on the plane. And then if I'm going to the jungles of Singapore, I can put these on and keep the bugs away. Uh, consider a hoodie if your head gets cold. Um, consider things with buttons or zippers so that you can, if you're hot, unbutton, just button up a few different things. I think loose fitting clothes are also best if you get like gassy or bloated or whatever, you know, not something that you're sitting in that it's so tight that you can't move or rustle uh, around. Uh, and uh, Alex says uh, tip 19.2 is travel with a yellow productions t-shirt. If you don't have a bamboo or black t-shirt, wear the yellow productions shirt and yes, if I know I'm gonna be vlogging, and you've seen some of those videos, in that case, I do have the yellow shirt on, and I'll just, I'll suck up the reflection in my in-flight entertainment. Ah, yes, Ilford says black shirt, so you can't see my food stains. That's a good tip. Uh, when I travel with our three-year-old daughter, then when it comes to uh, pants or shorts, uh, you know, what's on down here, then I will typically travel with black so that if something spills on me, yes, you can't see the stains. Uh, and Emmett says something about seeing people get on a plane with pajama bottoms doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't sit right with me either, Emmett. I feel like pajama bottoms are definitely a little too casual. Uh, Garris says bamboo versus merino. I wear merino wool socks, um, but I wear bamboo shirts. I find bamboo to be cooler in temperature than merino, um, but that's just me. Maybe I haven't found any good merino shirts, so if you know a source for merino shirts, let me know. Uh, I did recently take the tip of Bombus socks from a fellow explorer, and I now have 10 Bombus merino wool socks in my closet, in addition to my smart wool socks that I've been traveling with for a long time. Uh, <laughs> Carlos says, the best attire for planes is Crocs and socks. Please know, uh, I am I am the kind of person that would wear socks and sandals, but not Crocs. Although, uh, if you've heard the story of my incident in Ala Moana with sandals and the escalator, um, I never travel 
in airports or places I'm going with escalators anymore with sandals. Uh, one really awful experience with a toe and an escalator is enough for me. Okay. Tip number 20, this is my last tip before going to the airport, and I'll then we'll talk about the airport, and then we'll talk about it on the plane, uh, is to do as much at home to check in online as possible, just because the more stuff you've got to do at the airport, the more stressed out you're going to be, the more things that you might not have the right documentation or the right information, and so the more information you can provide checking in online, the better, the less stressful your day is going to be at the airport. Okay. Let's talk about things now you want to do when you get to the airport. It's the day of your flight. How do you set yourself up for surviving a long flight? First tip at the airport, but this is tip number 21 to survive a long flight is to arrive to the airport early so you don't have to rush. You know, if your flight is uh, American Airlines out of Madrid, you need to check your luggage in 75 minutes before departure time. <laughs> and now in the USA, there's a rule that if you're in line, you're considered on time. So if, if you were in line before check-in time and then it took you to the front counter, but you didn't get to the front counter in time, supposedly the airline is supposed to cut you some slack and still let you check in. I don't find it always works that way. <laughs> and so you should make sure you have enough time to get through all of the lines. And if you're flying an economy, the check-in lines are going to be the longest. And so be prepared for an hour standing to check in your luggage, be prepared for an hour going through security, be prepared for another half hour to go find your plane someplace in the airport. So if you don't wanna be stressed out three hours beforehand if you're in a big international airport. Tip number 22, and I heard this one in the chat earlier, is if you have access to a lounge, go hang out there before your flight because you know what, airports aren't always the most comfortable, relaxing places, but airline lounges sure are. If you have an Amex Platinum card, go hang out at the Centurion Lounge or go hang out at one of your um, many Priority Pass lounges you can get into. If you have a Chase Sapphire card, go hang out at the new Chase Sapphire Lounge in Boston. By the way, I'll have a full walkthrough of this lounge coming soon. This might just be one of my new favorite lounges in the USA. Tip number 23 is to fill your belly before getting on the plane. Yes, they serve you plain food. No, nobody likes plain food. Plain food just isn't all that good. And so pretty much anything you eat at the airport is gonna be better than pretty much anything they serve you on the plane. Um, avoid heavy or greasy foods or gassy foods that are gonna make you bloated or make you go to the bathroom. Look, you know your stomach better than anybody else. And so eat the kind of foods that like work out well for your tummy. Oh, this was the food at the uh, Boston Chase Sapphire Lounge, by the way. Then I'll talk through more of that when that video comes out. Tip number 24 when you get to the airport is to, is to fill up your water bottle. Uh, and in my case, if I've got a long flight, I bring two water bottles per person. Empty. I bring empty water bottles. I take the empty water bottles to security, and then I fill them up in a drinking fountain or water bottle filler before I go. Um... And, uh, you know, tip number 25 is to buy some snacks before you get on the plane if you didn't bring them with you from before when I told you to pack them from the night before or buy some food to get on the plane. Maybe you really want a cheeseburger, buy your cheeseburger on the land and eat it when you get on the plane. You know, a lot of people will bring the food on and wait for boarding and wait for takeoff and then eat their food. If I've got a cheeseburger, I just get on the plane and eat it right away because it's hot. Um, I might not have enough time in the airport, but if I have time at the airport, I'm eating it at the table because that's going to be way more comfortable than eating it on the plane. Chris, do you really smell up the airplane with a hamburger? No, not really. I'm usually not that guy with the hamburger and the french fries because um, I usually try to eat uh, in the airport. But there's been once or twice when I've been like super late misconnecting and I just have to run by a Wendy's or something, pick up a burger and eat it um, when I get on the plane. Uh, it's better to eat something than to eat nothing. Tip number 26 is to empty yourself, uh, be it your bladder or your number two before you get on the plane um, because the bathrooms land side are going to be better than the bathrooms on the airplane. I like to make a final bladder strike about five minutes before boarding. You know, I look at what time it is. I'm like, okay, it's about five minutes before boarding. 
I go, OC girl go, three-year-old daughter, princess, go, Papa, I don't need to go. Okay, well, you need to go. I don't need to go. As soon as we get on the plane, okay, I need to go. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, and tip number 27 is to uh, not, not get wasted before you get the plane. I know airport bars are super popular, you know, to have a vodka martini or 12. Uh, but, you know, uh, you drink too much and then you get into this state where you need to barf and you don't want to be that person on the airplane. All right, so now when you get on the airplane, I've got some tips for you. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I'll take this comment from Henry. Henry, uh, thank you for your support. Henry says, uh, good evening, Chris. Can you talk about a story where you had a bad flight experience, like a person next to you being very sick or a kid crying, etc.? I've had all of those things, but I think one of my worst experiences on a flight was the girl sitting next to me who was probably just turned 21 and was super drunk, super wasted. She reeked of alcohol. Uh, she was a chatty Kathy the whole flight. And I, by the way, I know we have a Kathy on the live stream from Australia. Kathy, I don't, I don't mean you in that chatty Kathy, but I mean the whole plane felt super bad for me because this girl just had so much to drink and I was ordering more to drink and overall that person that you, like seen everybody felt bad for me because I had to sit next to this person um you know I've certainly had my trips with a three-year-old daughter where I've gotten spit up on and those sorts of things which is why when I travel with her I always bring a change of clothes um, I, I could, I probably have a very long list of bad experiences, which is what leads to this list of things to do to avoid all those potential bad experiences. Uh, we can, we can talk through more of them when we get to Q and A. Uh, yeah, and Valerian says, uh, <laughs> smell of booze and pee, um, just not a good smell at all. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Wait, so we're still back here. All right. So. Uh, what do you do when you get on the plane to prepare yourself to survive a long flight in economy? First, tip number 28, is to not put too much stuff in your seat back pocket. You know, what I see people do is they get into their, they get in, they get comfy in their seat and then they're like, okay, I need to put my water bottle in there. I need to put my phone in there and I need to put my headphones in the pocket and I need to put my laptop in the pocket and I need to put a banana in the pocket. And like now there's like four more inches of stuff from that seat butting into your leg room. Uh, and like it really makes a difference, particularly if you're a tall dude like me, six foot tall. If you're not tall, like you're only five feet tall, maybe it's not a big deal if you got four inches of leg room. But if you're tall, try to put as little stuff in that seat back pocket as possible um, so that you still have more leg room. Tip number 29 is to uh, adjust the air vent above your head. So when I get on, if the plane is stuffy and I get into a row like this where I'm the only person in here and it's hot, the first thing I do, I open up all the vents in the ceiling if they're closed. Shh, 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 start to cool it down. Same token, if it's super cold and nobody else is in the aisle, I'll close them all. Um, now, once other people are in those seats, it's their job to manage the ones above their head. But for me, at takeoff time, I generally like cool air blowing on my head. And then, because, you know, if I'm like rattling around and getting kind of queasy, having some cool air is nice. But then once I get up in flight, then I generally like to turn the air vent off. And then when I get back towards landing again or it gets turbulent, then I like to open that air vent up again. And, you know, it doesn't just have to be full blast or closed. It can be like... 25% open just to get a little bit of coolness onto your head. Also, tip number 30, turn on or off the reading light. I I find so many people, they sit there and they got this like light blasting on them and they don't realize that like maybe it's a button on the armrest or a button in the in-flight entertainment to turn on or off the reading light. Pretty much every seat on every like long haul flight has lights that you can turn on to read from when the plane is dark. Um, and just because you're zon doesn't mean you have to suffer with it, turn it off. Um, but off isn't always the call button. Like there's a button that might be next to it and that's the one to call a flight attendant. It might be, like I say, on your armrest or even on newfangled planes in the touchscreen in flight entertainment to get to that, turn that light off. You can also often turn off the in-flight entertainment screen. If I'm trying to sleep, I have a hard time with these bright, 
um, lights of the in-flight entertainment in my eyes, and so I'll turn the brightness all the way down, which is maybe sometimes an option, or maybe their power button to turn it off. So do turn your in-flight entertainment off when you want to sleep. The armrests uh, go up and down, you know, to shimmy into your seat, raise the armrests up, put them down. What a lot of people don't realize is that if you're in the aisle seat, a lot of times the armrest on the aisle seat will go up too into the aisle, but there's often a hidden lever in the back like where the armrest connects to the chair that you gotta push up in order to lift that up. That works out really well if you've just been eating and you got a bunch of food on your tray table and you can't get rid of your stuff, but you wanna scoot out to the restroom, you can lift that armrest up with the hidden lever underneath it and then scoot out and get to the bathroom, leaving your stuff on the tray table just fine. And uh, tip number uh, 32, and this is something you can still do before takeoff that a lot of people don't realize or take advantage of is, look, if something strikes you and you gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta go to the toilet before takeoff, and they've yet to close the cabin door, you can go use those toilets. The toilets are open. You can go use them. If they're locked, you can ask the flight attendants to open them up again. They will let you use the restroom while people are still boarding the plane. Uh, and that's something where if I've got to take a mad dash to a plane to get on it, I make sure I get on the plane, and then I use the restroom. Now, don't be the don't be the dork that's like trying to swim upstream while everybody's like trying to get on the plane. You know, be respectful and figure out like, okay, once the crowds have narrowed down, then I can make my dash to the restroom. Uh, but you definitely can do it before they end boarding and before you take off because if you don't, it could be like an hour later before you can use the restroom again because, well, you got a taxi, and then you got to take off, then you got to wait for the turbulence to end, then you got to wait for them to turn off the seatbelt sign, so uh, use the restroom when you can. All right, now, what do you do after takeoff? This is tip number 33. Plane takes off. First thing, adjust your watch to your new time zone. Don't be living in your old time zone. Just put your head as soon as possible into the new time zone of where you're going. Tip number 34. Take off your shoes. Uh, this is provided your feet don't stink. You got your wool socks or something like that, not stinky socks that make your feet stink. But if your feet don't stink, take off your shoes, um, keep your socks on, uh, or put on some slippers. But there's a reason why in business class they provide slippers. Because the airlines are like, people are more comfortable and they can sleep better when their shoes off. I mean, do you sleep at home with your shoes on? Maybe you do. That's kind of weird. I know. Do you wear your shoes in bed? Weirdo. Um, but I will say, if you do take your shoes off, please don't go to the toilet with your shoes off. Put your shoes on before you go to the toilet. Y yuck. Uh, all right, tip number 35, recline your seat um, with the button that's generally on the side of the armrest. Slowly, please. Uh, don't be the person that like oh, goes like this because then you might end up knocking into their laptop or knocking into their food. So. You know, if someone in front of you was reclining, you would prefer if they do it slowly. So that's what you're gonna do as well. Tip number 36, adjust the headrest. The headrest on your seat generally goes up and down and usually has some wings that you can fold in. And so if you kind of want to like turn to the side and lean in to sleep, you can like put the wing up on the headrest. That'll do a good job to kind of like um, curl your head in. Tip number 37 is to manage your ear pressure. If you get pressure in your ears, don't wait till you're so stuffy that you're like, oh, I can't, my head, I can't hear anything and my brains are about to explode out of it. I do this because this maneuver helps me clear the air pressure from my ears. You know, you can try the, you can blow your nose, uh, you can chew gum, you can suck on a lozenge, you can try drinking. There's a lot of things to do to manage your ear pressure, but you wanna pay attention to it as it's building up and relieve it as it starts to just get a little bit there because once it's like super build up with pressure, then it's often harder to relieve it. Tip number 38 is to take the snacks and the drinks when they're offered. They don't come by all the time in economy to give you snacks and drinks. And even if you don't feel hungry right then, you don't know when they're gonna come by again, so take them. Uh, and a lot of times, look, they'll have snacks for you that you can go to the back or the galley or whatever and ask for snacks during flight, but it doesn't mean they're gonna have the ones they were handing out to you when they were handing them out. Um, so take them, stuff them in the seat back, eat them later, because um, you never know when you're gonna want a few little M&Ms. Uh, and if you want, like when they come by with drinks, if you're extra thirsty, you can often ask for two drinks. Like, hey, can I have a 
water and then apple juice or you can also often ask for the whole can you know it's like can i get some apple juice can i get the whole can of apple juice what i like to do sometimes is if i'm on an airline that's like stingy and they're only going to give me one drink i'll be like okay well then can i get can i get a cup or can i get a cup of apple juice and a separate cup of ice because now the ice is like more liquid to put into my apple juice once it melts Tip number 39 is uh, to use the toilet when you're able. I know we've talked about toilets a little bit earlier when boarding, but I wanna talk about using toilets when you're on the plane. Use the toilet, not just when it's urgent, uh, because you never know when you can actually go or when you can go again. And so use the toilet when you can, maybe even every hour. You know, like, Chris, do you really have to use the toilet every hour? I don't have to use the toilet every hour, but if I'm watching shows on my uh, iPad mini or my entertainment player, you know, between movies or whatever, like there's a natural blink. I'm like, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go use the restroom because it makes sure that if they turn that seatbelt sign on, I can't go for the next three hours that I'm not stuck with a bunch of stuff in me that I want to get out. Uh, and then two is if you're thinking about like timing when you want to go to the restroom on a plane, when does everybody go to the restroom? Everybody goes to the restroom about 10 minutes after eating. And so my recommendation is if you're somebody who needs to go to the restroom after you eat is like immediately after they take your tray, go to the restroom right now. Don't wait for everybody else to go like, oh, I think I have to go to the bathroom too. And now you're in line with 20 people, your tray is gone, go to the restroom. Um, particularly if it's the first time, like they've now pushed the meal service through, they've taken the first meal service, go to the restroom. It's the cleanest it's gonna be on the plane after everybody goes. Sometimes those restrooms can get a little bit yucky. Uh, tip number 40 is to take a, take a stretch break, you know? Move your neck around, move your things around, move your legs around, like, and on purpose sit there and be like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stretch, you know? Whether you do that in your seat, obviously not so you go into the people next to you, whether you do that when you walk in the restroom, whether you do that in the restroom after you wash your hands or dry your hands, you do that in the bulkhead with the flight attendants. Look, they get it. Everybody's like, oh, I'm sore. So if you're moving around a little bit without being super obnoxious, people are uh, totally going to be okay with it. Tip number 42 is talking about sleep. My last three tips here about sleeping, and then we're going to get into Q&A. Uh, if you're trying to sleep on a long flight, and boy, sleep is, sleep is beautiful. If you have a 15-hour flight, you have a 15-hour flight and you want to sleep, one of my tips is to bring an eye mask, um, a black one or a silly one like this, uh, because if you can block out the light on the plane, that'll help you just not even think you're on a plane, not seeing things moving. Um, earplugs may help. I wear the noise canceling headphones instead of earplugs. Buckle your seat belt over your blanket if you're wearing a blanket, because if you buckle it underneath the blanket, then when they come around to check for seat belts, they'll be like, Where's your seatbelt? It's on the blanket. I can't see it. So buckle your seatbelt over the blanket. Uh, if you really need to sleep and it helps you, tip number 43, and this works for OC Girl, is to take a sleeping pill. Um, or if not a sleeping pill, you could take something like Dramamine, which is a uh, motion sickness pill, but it makes you drowsy. Like sleeping isn't the effect of it, but it's a side effect of it. Um, and so that can work well on long flights. They need to be long enough that like the sleeping wears off. And if you're taking sleeping pills for a flight, Take them once you're well airborne. Um, because if you take them on the ground and your plane doesn't take off, you're gonna be really tired trying to get other flights or navigating your way through the airport. So, you know, uh, on a 15 hour flight, I would wait till a good hour into the flight before taking a sleeping pill to make sure that I, I know that flight isn't gonna like go back and land the turn around and, and let us off at the gate. Uh, and then tip number 44 is if you can't sleep, you're like, I'm trying to sleep, Chris. I just, I just can't sleep. I'd say try for an hour. And if you can't sleep after an hour, then turn on your TV or read a book or read a magazine for 30 to 60 minutes. Get up, take a restroom, stretch break, get something to drink, get a little nibble, and then try to sleep again. You know, you don't have to just force yourself in a really boring way, but you know, pick an activity, do it for a little bit, and then try again. Just the act of being still and your eyes closed for an hour um, will make you more rested if you're doing that on and off every hour than if you're just watching movies for 15 hours straight.
Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers, now you know everything you need to know to survive your next long flight, but what did I leave out? What questions do you have or what tips do you have that I didn't put in my 44? Uh, and Alex Jossie, thank you for your support earlier. Uh, and Zach says, what's the longest flight you've gone through? Yeah, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 17 hours. So um, LAX to Singapore, Bangkok, Sydney, Melbourne, Australia. Those are some of the longest flights I've been on that are like in the 15 to 17 hour range. Um, Amanda says, uh, is there a way to email Chris or how do you directly ask him questions? Amanda, the best way to ask me questions is just to leave a comment on an existing video on YouTube. I read all comments and I respond to anything that has a question there. Um, Narrow Rhodes says, I have restless leg syndrome, so late night flights are killer. Yeah, I guess when you got to move your legs around and in that case, then you don't want a flight that you sleep on. You want a flight that you're awake on. Uh, Kaj Full of Love says, Expect the worst, so be better than expect. That's a great tip. I expect the worst. I plan for delays. I plan for the sleep, crying babies. Uh, and so if I don't have them, then hey, hey good times. Um, Gareth says, if my United status reset today, would you go for stats with another airline alliance? Uh, so I have um, lifetime, uh, like Star Alliance gold status with United. Would I go for stats with another airline? I mean, United still flies where I like to fly from where I live. Being in Southern California, United has the most flights to Asia. We fly to Asia a lot. So United status still makes sense for us. Um, and uh, Alex just left a uh, just left a suitcase sticker. And yes, that is more appropriate. Thank you for your support with the suitcase, Alex. I appreciate it. Um, Nick says, how do you deal with kids whose parents don't tell them to stop kicking your seat. Uh, I would I would just kindly look over and say, hi, would you would you mind not kicking my seat? I'm trying to sleep. I'd appreciate it. In a very calm, sweet way. That's what I would do. Um, Valerian says, uh, do all planes have Wi-Fi? No, not all planes have Wi-Fi. And even if they do have Wi-Fi, it doesn't work half the time, I feel like. So I never depend on internet. Um, Point Traveler says, would you fly Zip Air to Japan? No in-flight entertainment, even in business class. We were considering it on this last trip to take Zip Air. We decided not to because it seemed more expensive once we had all the fees than just flying uh, United back. Um, but uh, if the price was right, and for me, for a 10-hour flight, you know, I'm going to at least try to keep my eyes closed or sleep for half of that if I can, uh, and so the iPad uh, mini player will give me all the entertainment that I need. Carlos points out that the Asiana A380, the double-decker plane from Airbus, does not have any Wi-Fi. Um, Kilmerville says, what do you think of the new fees that Europe will be instituting for travelers in 2024? I think it's short-sighted of Europe. I think it's just gonna make it really annoying for people to get there. I guess that's what they need to do to make what, eight bucks a person that go to Europe or something like that? I'm sure they just, they're like, well, the U.S. does it, so we can get in on this cash grab too. Lame. Uh, Jake says, for a really long trip in economy, would you prefer a direct flight or a connection in the middle to break it up? I would prefer the long direct flight um, because I've only got a board once and get off once and I'm more certain it'll get there, right? Like if I have a connection in the middle, even though it breaks it up, you know, uh, it might not be in a great airport. It might be delayed there. Like it's more chances for delays, more chances for being stuck. And so I much prefer just from where I'm going to where I'm going, having a direct flight, even if that means it's super, super long. Eternal Trick says, how do you deal with people who take up more than one seat of space? Like, I guess this is the like, if they're like edging into your seat or something like that. I mean, it sort of depends. Like if the person is just too big for one seat, there's nothing you can do about them. That's them. That's how they are. Um, but if they're not like just physically that large and they're like their arms over here, or their jackets over here, you know, I'll just gently try to, hmm, or with my foot, like I like to try to guard my space, you know, and like at the point that they give it up, at the point that they go to the bathroom or something like that is when I like reassert myself to be like, all right, my seat, you know, and this is the like, 
if you're in the middle seat and aisle seat and window seat next to you, middle seat, you get both armrests. Now, you don't get both armrests and stick them out into those other people, but you get both armrests. And so, um, you know, those are things I'll be sort of assertive over my space. I won't be like, hey, jerk, get out of my space, because that doesn't lead to, like, a lot of friendly vibes for your seatmate for the next 15 uh, years. Uh, Alex, has any exciting trips coming up for you and the fam? Uh, I think the next big one for us is going to be a Disney cruise to... And Sonata. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, and Jenny Fide says, I would handle the encroaching person situation the same that you do. Glad that uh, most people think alike. JW says, There's a new premium, new low cost carrier, Air Premia, to US destinations, LAX and JFK. Cool. I'll have to look into that, JW. Have you flown it? I'm curious. Janice says, What do you do when someone leans all the way back and you cannot even use your tray to eat? What do you do? Uh, when it's eating time, I might like ask the flight attendant, like when they, when the flight attendant, actually I don't, I'm not might do, like when the flight attendants come by and they put food on the tray, if this person's all the way back, I'd ask the flight attendant, I'd be like, Hey, would you mind asking them if they can, you know, bring their seat up? That's how I handle that. If someone isn't enough to like raise their seat forward, but their seat reclines, your seat reclines. And so if their seats reclined, then, you know, your seat reclining is like the best defense against their seat reclining. And I know you spread the wealth backwards, but pretty much everybody's seat reclines except for the suckers that are stuck in the emergency exit row. But in that case, they've generally got a little bit more leg room. And so that seat reclining into them isn't as big of a deal. Daniel says, Chris, how about ordering Uber Eats or DoorDash to the check-in counter to save money and get in and out? That sounds like a good idea. Uh, I haven't done it because I, I think that'd be hard for them to actually find you or park or, or get out of it. Um, Irina says, I was told by a doctor it's better to take an aisle seat than a window seat so we can move in and out uh, easier to avoid developing blood clots. I am definitely on team aisle seat. I like my aisle seats because I like to get up a lot. I don't like to be stuck and sedentary. But, you know, on my last flight to Boston... Uh, I didn't book it super early. I, well, I actually did. I did. I booked it super early, but JetBlue, they suck when it comes to seat selections. And three days before, <laughs> I didn't have any seats reserved anymore. Ha <laughs> Because they had like a plane change or something. Uh, and so then, you know, I ended up with a window seat on the way there and a middle seat on the way back. Uh, it's not what I love, but, you know, anytime I got a chance to get up, because these people got up, I was getting up too. Um, and even if I wasn't, you know, in a six-hour flight, I'm probably getting up twice, um, you know, and I'll like, I'll pace it, right? I'll be like, okay, six hour flight. So two hours in, I'm going to get up and another two hours in, I'm going to, I'm going to get up again. Mm. Jason Law says, <clears throat> if you have a whole road yourself, do you sleep on all three? For me, I'm six feet tall. And so I don't even fit on all three this way. Um, for me, uh, if I have all three, then I, I just kind of spread out this way, you know, which is pretty nice. But uh, I think if you're shorter, like five feet tall, then I think you could probably get a good uh, long lie down on that aisle. Daniel says, how do you like SAS economy? I've flown SAS economy. It's been a while. I, I don't know. I find like a lot of European economy to be really, really pretty rough. Um, Francis says, what's the worst economy flight you've ever taken? Some bizarre discount carriers. I mean... I don't know. I think also there was like, there was an American Airlines flight that I took that was on a, it was on Dreamliner that was not 10 seats. It was not nine seats across. It was 10 seats across. And I was like, that was, that was really cramped. Um, I mean, there's like the worst flights I've taken, the flights that don't go, you know, the flights that are like canceled entirely um, or the flights where they like lose our luggage or those sorts of things. You know, the 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 economy flight that we took and it's not about the seat, right? We flew. I mean, the worst flight, not probably one of my worst experiences. And this is more of a lost luggage flight, but I was flying from uh, San Diego to Washington, Dulles on United Airlines, and then Washington Dulles to um, Brussels on Air Brussels. And uh, that connection uh, from Dulles to Brussels, they lost my luggage. And then from Brussels, I was flying on to 
France. I was like a, how many, how many connections is it? a lot of connections? And so when I get to France, they don't have my suitcase and they could not, for the life of me, they could not find where my suitcase was. I had to call Air Brussels, their baggage claim counter, their lost luggage counter is only open from 10 to 12 and two to four Brussels time. Anyway, my luggage never showed up in France. I had to buy a whole bunch of new stuff. And then uh, when I came home a month later, I got a call from uh, US Airways, no longer around, but US Airways called me and said, hey, uh, your flight just arrived in the San Diego airport from Phoenix. Do you want to come pick it up? I'm like, great, I want to pick it up. I got it, I opened it up, soaked, soaking wet, soaking wet. Uh, gross, I had to throw everything away. It's all probably been wet for an entire month. Um, and so that was one of my worst uh, travel experiences. Yes, I did file a claim and get some money back for all the stuff that was in my luggage. Um, but this is one of the many reasons why I recommend hard shell cases instead of soft shell cases. That was a soft shell case. Hard shell case would have been immune to rain. I think what happened is there was a thunderstorm in Washington Dulles. They called a ground stop. My suitcase was somewhere out, you know, on the belt going into the plane. Wind came, it fell off. I don't know. They threw it in the river. <laughs> they, they caught it back later. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was uh, that. Was that. Um, Alex says, the trifecta of horrible airlines, Frontier, Allegiant, Spirit. I avoid them all like the plague because I've heard way too many stories about all of them. And so I just, I don't need to fly them to experience uh, those stories. And Alex says, U.S. Airways was absorbed by American. Indeed, it was. Um... Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, Phil Explorers, as usual in every live stream, I give away a Yellow Productions Crew shirt to somebody who can answer one of my questions correctly. And to win this Yellow Productions Crew shirt, well, not this one, this is my prop to show you, but I will ship you a new one in your size. You'll win it if you're the first person to answer my question, which was, uh, at one point, I held up in this video a bag. Oh, that's not it. At one point, I held up a bag of chips. What brand and flavor was that bag of chips? If you're the first person to answer that question correctly, you will win that Yellow Productions Crew shirt shipped to you anywhere in the world. If you don't win one and you want to pick one up and support the channel, you can do so at the Yellow Productions shop. You'll find it right here. Also link in the description below. Uh, and if you wonder, Chris, when is the next, next live stream? Should be next week, uh, but I'm not sure the day yet. If you want to know, head over to the Yellow Productions Update, sign up for my email list, and I will email you as soon as I know the time, the date, and the topic of my next live stream. And if you want to support the channel, but you don't want to buy a Yellow Production shirt, well, the best way of doing that is by joining as a channel member. Those people in the chat that you see, the cool panda icon next to them, they're channel members, and they support quality programming like this, and I thank them very much. And now we have a winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay, so uh, we have Ilford 6x6 that says Ruffles All Seasoned. And uh, no, no, that's not it. Let's see. Uh, Cottage Full of Love uh, is the closest first answer. Kaj full of love. You win it. Ruffles all dressed up. Congratulations. You added up at the end, but you got ruffles and all dressed. So uh, I'll, I'll give it to you in the, what, croquet or horseshoes or something like that for being close. Uh, Kaj full of love. Send me an email. Chris at yellow-productions.com. You'll find that email in the description below. And as always, everyone, super great hanging out with you all today. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up on the way out. It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. And as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in the next video.